know, one of the things I'm beginning to pick up in my spirit, you know, with biblical life has been known for teaching the Word, and sometimes it's like that song that never ends, it's the teaching that never ends sometimes. But God began putting in my spirit that this is also going to become a place for healing. Supernatural healing of families, of bodies, of spirits that have been broken, of hearts that have been broken. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing that. I love it when I, I see people that the world has given up and said there's no hope. And all of a sudden, God intervenes. Oh, it's strong this morning, isn't it? Praise God. We're on session eight of end of day spiritual warfare, and I'm going to wrap up this series this morning. I think that uh, the next series we're going to start, I'm going to call it Building Blocks of the Kingdom, of having the, the proper things built into our lives. We were talking on Skype here a couple of Wednesday nights ago, and uh, it just kind of rose up in my spirit as Pastor Williams was sharing some things they're going through in Tennessee, that there, there are bricks to the road of righteousness that have got to be maintained for us to be able to walk with God. But as I wrap this up, I don't think we're going to be a long time today. Now, when I just said that, turn to your neighbor and say, we've heard that before. But I, I, I want to begin, I want to go back to Revelation chapter 3 this morning. You know what's interesting, and we, we have those that try to tell us that after dealing with the Laodicean church, that the church is no longer seen in the book of Revelation, according to some. I see it all the way throughout the book of Revelation. But they say that after this, they're all taken up into heaven. And uh, those that are pre-tribulationists. But when I look at this, what I see is the rest of the book of Revelation is a manifestation of verse 18. But I want to I start here with verse 17. Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increase with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest thou not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see, as, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. I actually believe that the rest of the book of Revelation is the church learning how to buy gold refined in the fire. Now, when, when I look at this, I look for some insights. Uh, Dake points out that there are f a full Ford counsel that Jesus gives to the Laodicean church. Buy of me gold tried in fire. Gold tried in fire. Buy of me white raiment. Anoint your eyes with eye salve. Be zealous to save your souls and repent. Now, how many know we've already dealt with before many times in, in current American version of Christianity, repent is the last thing that you hear. But yet, Jesus says you need to be zealous to repent. Zealous to repent. Now, I, I guarantee you one thing. If, if we held a seminar and we advertised it and I, I said, I have found biblical truths that could make you a millionaire in less than a year, that we probably couldn't find a place big enough to hold all of it. Because that is what the Laodicean church wants to hear. But if I said, we're going to learn repentance, we might even thin out this crowd. But yet Jesus said, be zealous to repent. You see, one of the things, what's interesting is I was reading some more modern commentators on this verse, and you'd be surprised how much they dance around, buy for me fire, you know, buy for me gold. They dance around and says, well, you know, the prophets say, you know, come to me with no money, sit down and eat. It's talking about salvation. It's talking about being able to be fed upon the word of God. When the prophet said that, we need to understand salvation is free but spiritual development is going to cost you something. 
That's one of the reasons why we see in so much of the church, in the Laodicean church, there is no true spiritual development because it's going to cost you something. You're going to have to give up the world. You're, we go back and the Apostle Paul talks about needing to crucify the flesh. The Laodicean church doesn't want to crucify the flesh. It wants to pamper the flesh and deck it out with the things of this world. Just kind of this thinking on some of these, and I'm going I'm to tap into them a little bit more here just in a second, but we don't want to, we, we think that we can have gold that has never been touched by fire. Isn't that the way the church is preached in America? You know, the funny thing about gold is it's impossible to refine it without fire. The hotter the fire, the more pure the gold because the impurities, the dross, raise us to the top. And many times it has to go through cycles of purification. How, how pure can God make gold? Man has yet to be able to, I've seen white gold, I've seen yellow gold, but I have yet to see clear gold. When God gets through removing the impurities, it can be clear. I also thought it was interesting that he, he encourages them, anoint, get, get the eye salve to anoint your eyes. And one of the things that raised up in my spirit is have we had another anointing that blinds instead of giving vision? Everybody's always talking about anointing and anointing this, anointing that on, on television and radio. But the, the more I think we, we receive the, th the preaching of the Laodicean church, the blinder you become. How many of us have tried to share the word with people? Christians, not the world, but Christians. And they have ears that do not want to hear. They have eyes that do not want to see. Unless it's about getting rich or about something of the flesh or something. Let me tell you something. There are, there are more important things in your life than the flesh. There are more important things. I know that's hard to... I remember I made a statement years ago in the, the course I did on the life of faith that God is more interested in your spiritual condition than he is in your soul and he'll withhold, he'll withhold a blessing physically from you to do something in your spirit. And uh, Dr. John Friders was teaching that up in a federal medium security prison in Canada. And the inmates begin to argue with him. No, God just wants me to have all kinds of stuff. And I'm thinking, dude, you're in prison because you wanted stuff you didn't pay for. <laughs> and now you're arguing with the man of God, pointing back to the word, because God's more interested in your spiritual condition. If you would have maybe put as much emphasis on your spiritual condition as you had on other areas of your life, you probably wouldn't be sitting there. But yet at the same time, how many Christians are sitting in spiritual prisons Because all the emphasis in Laodicea is about blessing and is, a, is about physical things, tangible things. Anything that you can hold in your hands can pass away. Anything that you can hold in your hands can be taken away from you. Anything that, holds in your, that you can hold in your hands can deceive you. The Laodiceans confused wealth with spirituality. You can kind of see that same symptom with the rich young ruler that came to Jesus. And oh boy, he had kept all the commandments and it had prospered him. But somehow along the line, he transitioned from having faith in the God that gave the commandments to where he was saying, look, I got all this and this is proof that I'm walking with God. And God says, give it all up. Now, actually, he missed a great blessing because when you give unto the poor, the Bible says you lend unto the Lord, he's going to repay. He missed one of his biggest blessings, but I think one of the things in his mind was maybe, maybe that uh, blessing wasn't going to be a, 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 the best donkey on the block that's a Lexus, you know. He was worried that God was going to have him drive a, a, a Pinto or something, you know. You just never know, but the things on the inside... The things on the inside of you cannot be taken away. When God begins to instill things on the inside of you, the kingdom has to first come within, and then it can be manifested without. God is always interested in the condition of the heart of an individual. And as we, I, th I believe that as we move forward in the last days, that it's going to be the heart. We're going to quit looking on the outside. 
I have seen too many men of God get impressed with riches, get impressed with big buildings, get impressed with just a lot of the things of the world, or the having affluence in the world. Uh, Jesus didn't have affluence in the world. That worldly system attacked him. And he was hated because he wouldn't bow down to that worldly system. At the same time, the very nature around him bowed down to him. All he had to do to still a storm was say, peace be still. You see, if the worldly system doesn't control you and you have a greater kingdom on the inside of you, then God can use you to control the things of the world around you. If they're not controlling you, you can control them if you're submitted to God. But I think it's interesting that the, the, the term here, buy of me, that's agorizo in the Greek. A-G-O-R-A-Z-O, it's Strong's number, Greek 59, this, those of you who want to research. And it speaks about a marketplace. That's one of, the words, one of the words that the Apostle Paul uses for redeem, agorizo and ex agorizo. And Dake brings out this. He said that this word, the term for, that God is using, a buy of me, is to be in the marketplace to do business there. The word is used here in the sense of doing business with God on his terms. On his terms. As we move toward the end of days, God is no longer going to deal with you on your terms. He's only going to deal with you on his terms because our terms have been destroying the kingdom. Our terms is how you end up being the Laodicean church. And it's going to be on his terms. Man sold himself a slave to sin and Satan. God paid the price of his redemption. Man is now obligated to meet God's terms of faith, repentance, and service if he wants to be redeemed. The word is not used here of man actually paying a price in money or goods, exchanging material things for gold, raiment, and ointment, uh, in, here in Revelation, but rather of his paying the price of renouncing Satan, repenting of sins, and consecrating to God in face of suffering persecution such as Christians must suffer for Christ. It's, how, it's, it's amazing to me. I don't always agree with Dake, but I really agree with him here. And we don't even hear anymore about having to suffer for Christ. There's a purification process. He goes on to say, gold tried in fire, this represents true faith. And let me tell you something, you only know you have faith when you've had to climb the mountain and you've had to, you've had to go through the fire. Faith unchallenged is not faith, it's presumption. We, if our faith is true, we can go through the valley of the shadow of death and come out on the other end and have a banquet. I want you to think about that for a minute. If I have true faith and faith that is pure before God, it has always been tested. I remember when I was in the military. There are several bases, or one of them's in White Sands, called Proving Grounds. And you wouldn't believe how many uh, inventors under DARPA and those that have come up with these really neat weapons that are supposed to save soldiers' lives that utterly fail and are dismissed on the Proving Grounds. And yet, we as believers, somehow we've been, we've been sold the lie that God gives us weapons that never have to be tried. God gives us words that never have to be tried. I usually find out that when God really gives me something, it's usually tested the next week. That if it's not tested within a week or two, I go back and wonder, was that bad pizza that I was hearing? Because the enemy always comes to steal the word. He always goes back to that garden principle as, has God really said? I remember the first time in my life I started believing for divine healing was the first time I got that sick in my life. I remember when I began believing for God to meet my, my basic needs, and, and uh, I, I was listening to all this faith teaching, and there's nothing wrong necessarily with faith teaching, but I think it needs to be in balance. And uh, I was getting mad at God because, you know, I'm standing in faith, I'm giving, and I'm going bankrupt. You know what the turning point was? It wasn't in finding out the right gift to give to get. The turning point I can go back to is when Mary and I decided, God, if we lose everything, we're still serving you. If I lose everything I've got, 
it doesn't matter because I'm not serving you for what I'm going to get. I'm serving you because of what I got at the cross, at salvation. That was a turning point in our lives because that faith became true when it was tested. And the testing wasn't getting more stuff. It was being willing to say, God, I don't need stuff as long as I got you. The thing that I think that we need to ask more than anything this morning, because so much on the Christian airwaves and what is so popular in America is what's called pre-tribulationism. We're going to get out of here before we get tribulated. Well, then God needs to apologize to a lot of the saints before us, doesn't he? And I have wondered, is tribulation the fire in which true spiritual gold must be forged in the last days? Now, I want to read a quote out. There's a guy named George Elad, who was a professor of New Testament theology and New Testament exegesis at Fuller University back in the 50s. Very esteemed scholar. Very, I, I love his honesty. In fact, when uh, he, read, he wrote, there's, one, oh, there's several books he's done. One is called The Blessed Hope. There's another one called Last Things. Last Things is the study of the end times and, and that type of thing. And he also did a verse-by-verse -verse commentary on the book of Revelation. And uh, it kind of perked my interest when I was reading the, uh, the book by, Do by Dr. Juster on Israel, the church in the last days. He said, I kind of agree with George Ladd. And uh, I had been given several of his books years ago. And sometimes, you know, when, you, when you're not prompted to get the books by the Holy Spirit, but somebody gives them to you, they kind of set up on the shelf for a while. But that's what shelves are for, so that they're there, that you can pull them down when you need them. And I thought, I'm going to go back and read his stuff. I have fallen in love with Brother Ladd. I just love his honesty. And I want to read because we, we have, we have pre-tribulationists to say, well, you know, it, even though we can't really date it being preached, they, they call it Darbyism, uh, that the pre-tribulation rapture was never really preached until the 19th century ever. They try to go back and take snippets of the early church fathers. And Dr. Ladd does such a wonderful job of just an honesty saying, this is what they taught here. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't realize that all millennialism, all millennialism uh, believes that we're, gonna, we're supposed to conquer this planet for Jesus. And then after we get that done, he come back, we're going to skip the millennial reign, go right to new heaven and new earth. That's actually, it was originated as a Catholic theology. That after the Catholic Church began to take hold, that they said that it was your job to conquer the earth in the name of Jesus under a, a rod, an iron of rod, and then Jesus could come back when everybody on the planet becomes Catholic. That's where all millennialism comes from. But I, I want you to listen to just his honesty of, of reading through what the early church fathers had to say, because how many know the closer you get back to the book of Acts, probably the, the more correct they were? In this survey of early centuries, we have found that the church interpreted the book of Revelation also along futuristic lines, i.e., they understood the book to predict the uh, the ecclesi or the echo. I brushed my teeth this morning, now I can't do a thing with my mouth. Eschatological events that would end the earth or the world. The Antichrist was understood to be the evil ruler of the end times who would persecute the church, afflict her with great tribulation. Every church father who deals with the subject expects the church to suffer at the hands of the Antichrist. God would purify the church through suffering, and Christ would save her by his return at the end of the tribulation when he would destroy the Antichrist, delivering his church and bringing the world to an end and inaugurate his millennial kingdom. The prevailing view is post-tribulational premillennialism. We can find no trace of pre-tribulationism in the early church, and no modern pre-tribulationist has successfully prove that this particular doctrine was held by any of the church fathers or students of the word before the 19th century. That is extremely important. If we're going to fight for the faith that was once delivered into the saints, understanding the end times is part of that faith. Now, it really sounds good to not have to go through nothing. Tell that to the Apostle Paul. 
tell that to the early Christians that were under the persecution of the Roman church. And under the persecution of the Roman church, the early church father said, the end times is going to be worse and the church is going to go through it. So maybe it's time, you see, part of end time spiritual warfare is realizing that there is always a price to be paid for walking with God, to be victorious. And God is calling us to grow a backbone. God's calling us to grow a backbone. You know, it's different. I've served in the military. And how many know it's different than, you know, boys out playing soldier out on the playground? How many know it's a lot different than a, a, a Navy SEAL team preparing for battle? If you've ever been in the military, you, you know that maneuvers are, are not anything to be trifled with. Uh, when I was in America, the first place that I was stationed, it, 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 was, it was, yeah, we're just, we're just going out, we're playing camp. When I was in Germany, and this was back before the Berlin Wall fell, I had East German soldiers that wanted to take us down with, um, by air like a, off a, on, a, uh, on a helicopter. They were 15 minutes away. How many know maneuvers took a whole different attitude? You, you begin paying attention to stuff. You go, okay, oh, no, this is why we do this, and this is why we do this, and this is how we, per, this is how we protect our, per, our, our perimeter, and, and here's how we, we station, here's the proper use of our weapons, because in America, you know, the, what's the chances of Russians necessarily coming and attacking Fort Sale down in Oklahoma? But how many know when you're 15 minutes away from an entire nation of the enemy, all of a sudden that you don't, you don't play war anymore, you're preparing for war. And that's part of the clarion call to the body of Christ is that we're going we're going we're going to see some of the most powerful things that we have ever seen in the history of the church. But somehow or another we have forgotten that the power of God always comes when the power of the devil always comes against his people. How many know that you can't see an angel come down and kill 180,000 Assyrians until 180,000 Assyrians are, are, are parked out at your camp getting ready to kill you the next morning? That's when you see a miracle like that. You don't see a parting of a Red Sea until you have a pharaoh at your back coming at you. You don't see these things until the enemy tries to take you out and God raises up to take you through. Somehow or another, we have forgotten that. We want the blessings... Without the warfare, we want the blessings without ever having the enemy come after us. That, that is the lie of the Laodicean church. And what's interesting about Laodicea, it was a place of banking for the whole world around them. That was the place of commerce. That was the epitome of not only a centralized banking system, but of, of capitalism. Well, now you're preaching communism. No, I'm not. Communism is this one step away from Luciferianism. You don't put your faith in communism or any ism. You put your faith in Almighty God and His kingdom. I mean, you know, to, to have any kind of commerce, you have to have capitalism. But you don't trust in it. You don't let it take you over. The only thing that can ever keep ca uh, capitalism in balance is the ethics outlined in the Word of God. The minute that a nation goes down is when it forgets the ethics that God established. Without those, capitalism can't really exist. Did you know that? Unless, I, unless we both understand there's a standard and there's honesty there, you remove that, it can't stand. That's one of the reasons why capitalism right now is sinking in the planet. is because the church has stopped being salt in the earth to show that there are standards God requires us to live by. There's something I want to put out there to kind of make you think just for a minute. So the whole reason why communism is raising and capitalism is failing may have to do more with the church than anything else because we have established ourselves as Laodicea. Everything's about money. No, it's not. Well, you know, the Bible says money answers all things. But if you read and put it back into context, that was also a preacher who had been deceived. Solomon, we begin to say, I was told, you know, I always thought money answered everything, but you know, I found out it's all vanity. You build it all up to pass it to somebody else who's going to be worse off than you were. 
going to be less moral than you are, that's going to be more stupid than you are. But yeah, boy, we can take that one snippet and make it sound good, can't we? Money answers everything. There's been many a ship that has sunk because of too much money. I remember the story of an old country preacher, and he had a young guy that just was serving Jesus with all his heart, and began to tithe, and God began to bless, went to college, and he didn't, he didn't hear from the kid for years. And comes back a 40-year-old man far from God, been sinning hard his whole life. Came back to that preacher and said, you know, I, I miss the good old days, the days when I, I walked with God and I could feel the presence of God. And the preacher looked at him and said, well, the first thing you need to do is start tithing. Oh, I can't do that. Why not? It would be millions. It would be multiplied millions that I would be required to give to God. The preacher said, let me pray for you. God, bring Jimmy back to the place where he can tithe. That gets the attention of the Laodicean church pretty quick because he had trusted in his riches. But how many know riches deceive? The Bible says there's a way that seems good unto a man but leads to death. Riches is one of those ways. You can have riches just as long as riches don't have you. You can't buy your way into the kingdom. You can't buy your way into affluence. It becomes a deception to you. And the Laodicean church was so deceived. I shared this last week. Jesus said, I stand at the door and knock. It was a church that should have been just absolutely ready for him to come back. But yet that last church age is so far off that Jesus has to start the betrothal process all over again. He's standing on the outside knocking to get in. And say, because in the betrothal process, that's where the woman begins to discern in her life what she needs to change to come in line with the bridegroom. Let me tell you something. The church is not in line with the bridegroom today. We have been constantly changing him instead of changing us to be like him. He said, not only do we need to buy gold tried in the fire, but we need to have white raiment. Let's go to Revelation chapter 19, verses 6 through 8. You know, there was a time in my life if I needed something fixed at the house. You know, you used to think you'd find a brother in the church that was a contractor or was an electrician or something like that to do stuff. And you find out sometimes it's almost better to find a heathen that has ethics than to try to find a believer sometimes because for some reason we, the Laodicean church has, well, that's okay. We're just going to greasy grace on everything. So they put greasy grace on their work and just, just slap it together and hope for their best. That's how one time I got 20 run to where my TV and satellite and all that was. I was paying a believer to run, uh, run a new junction box into the house, and so he wired my living room for 220. How many know that ain't good? Then I couldn't claim it on insurance because then the insurance would have sued him. But if you found a professional... Be, uh, there, there needs to be that level of professionalism in the body of Christ because we're representing Jesus. Aren't we? You see, we, we've forgotten about the white raiment. Starting in verse 6, And after I heard the sound like the sound of a vast throng, like the boom of many pounding waters, and I'm reading this out of the Amplified, just in case you're thinking what kind of King James Version he's reading here. And like the roar of a terrific and mighty peal of thunder, exclaiming, Hallelujah, praise the Lord, for now is the Lord our God, the omnipotent, the all-powerful ruler reigns. Let us rejoice and shout for joy, ex uh, exulting and triumphant. Let us celebrate and ascribe to him glory and honor, for the marriage of the Lamb at last has come, and his bride has made herself ready. 
and she has been permitted to dress in fine radiant linen, dazzling in white, for the linen is, signifies, represents the righteousness, the upright, just, and godly living deeds and conduct and right standing with God of the saints. Then when he says, buy of me raiment that your nakedness would not be revealed, biblically and hebraically, it's what you do in this life. We have so preached salvation not of works that after you get saved, you live on spiritual warfare the rest of your life. How many know that once you've been saved, it's time to roll up your sleeves in the kingdom? It's time to begin living according to this book. You couldn't do it before Jesus came into your life. And now we use grace not to do it once he has. Is that not an oxymoron? Now that Jesus has come into my life and I've been filled with the Holy Ghost, I still just can't help from sin and I can't do anything the Bible tells me to do. You know what Jesus just called you? He called you naked. We got too many streakers in the kingdom thinking they're living for Jesus. That the bride can't go down to Dave's bridal store and buy her a white ground without spot and a wrinkle that someone else has tailored. That someone else has bleached and cleaned and pressed and all she has to do on the wedding day is to get into it. This is one that God requires her to construct herself by the life she has been living in the kingdom of God. And right now, the body of Christ is dressed like most of the women out on the beach in California. There's not enough cotton in what they're wearing to put in the top of an aspirin bottle. And they think that they are robed. And Jesus says, I'm coming back for a woman who's dressed from head to toe in righteousness. Who's dressed head to toe. She is prepared to function in the kingdom. But yet this bride of this generation knows how to flow in the kingdom of darkness and the world, but does not know how to flow in the kingdom of God. She gets mad when you start talking about commandments. Well, Jesus conquered those. But you know you just got to sin every day. Because there's grace. Wait till we get to the building blocks of the kingdom. You're going, to be fine. You're going to be surprised to find out what grace really is. It isn't an excuse to sin. Remember the old song, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound? It's grace that taught me how to fear. And then grace, my fear relieved. Grace convicts the snot out of you until you embrace the cross. And once you embrace the cross and you re Repent, then that same grace comforts you. But unless that grace calls you to repentance, you're not dealing with grace. And what I have found in the cycles of walking with God in grace, the deeper I get into His grace, the finer line I walk because the more it causes me to repent. The more it causes me to begin emptying every weight that so easily besets me. And yet what we have now is we have Christians with these 90-pound backpacks called grace that they can put all the rocks in. And at the same time, they're weighed down with everything the world has to offer. They're telling me they're rapture ready. How many know if you're going to start a jumping contest, last thing you want is 500 pounds in your backpack? And yet we do it. I like what Dr. David Stearns here says from the, the Jewish New Testament commentary throughout the Bible. White, clean clothes refers to the righteous deeds of God, of deeds God gives his people to do so that they may exercise and express their faith. That they may exercise and express their faith. That they may exercise and express their faith their faith. Right now, believers don't believe in exercise. 
They don't want to exercise their faith. He goes on to say, contrast the outward righteous works which people without faith organize themselves to do. These God calls filthy rags. When it's on the outside and not on the inside, it is a facade. Isn't it? How many have ever had somebody you know, tell you that they really care for you and they really love you and all this other stuff, and you find out they really couldn't even stand you? You know, some guys find they're married to people like that. You know, God needs to work a miracle. But you, you find out that the facade isn't very good. Or you go to the store and you pay top dollar for something that's supposed to be the purest chocolate, the best thing in the world, and you find out it's imitation everything. It, le it leaves a waxy taste in your mouth and it's supposed to be pure milk chocolate or whatever. Can you imagine God? Because God receives our lives as worship. Worship is not just what we do when we're here. Just like spiritual warfare is not like when we, when we were praying, before I begin preaching, we begin to pray and lift up people. There, that is, in a sense, spiritual warfare, isn't it? You're praying, you're binding up things, you're loosing things. But what we have forgotten is that is one fraction of spiritual warfare. Spiritual warfare is played out 24-7 by what we do from our hearts. If I'm doing sin from my heart, I'm loosing the devil into every area of my, of my life. But if I begin doing righteousness from my heart because the Holy Spirit is making this come alive, I begin closing all these doors to the devil and I begin opening up all these doors to God. But the conundrum that we have in the body is we have many believers that have been taught, I can live like I want, but I got power and authority in the name of Jesus. Why should the devil respect the name of Jesus when you don't? If you believe you don't have to do what this word says, what makes you think he's going to have to think he has to do what the word says through you? That's why we have had a lot of believers that have entered into spiritual warfare and they end up being like the seven sons of Sceva that the world finds out their nakedness and they go running on down the road for everybody to see. You see, there's been a lot of people that have gotten into spiritual mapping and a lot of different things and they have poked bears they shouldn't have poked and their lives weren't ready because they think that spiritual warfare is that moment of intense prayer. Let me tell you something. The only way that you can enter into a true moment of intense prayer is if you have a life that is dressed in white. There's a reason why the cowboys always believe that the good guys wear white, wear the white hat, they actually get that from the Word of God that they knew that there had to be righteousness to gain the victory. You know, it used to be that the, the guy that was living right and doing the right things was the guy who was able to go to uphold the law. Hmm? You can't uphold a law that you're violating. You want the devil to obey God's law when you don't. Because the same law that says this is sin is the same law that says he can be bound. You can't have it both ways. This is not Burger King. You cannot have it your way. If, it, if Jesus is the king, and this is his law, and if I'm walking with the king, I have got to be a good citizen, a law-abiding citizen of the kingdom, and then I'm able to make citizens arrests. But you can't come in your BVDs and try to do warfare with the devil. But a lot of believers find themselves, in, and, and the Laodicean church is going to find itself in that position. There are a lot of prophets that's been talking about that there are going to be a lot of Christians that are going to, all the, thing, all the air castles that they have built and candy-coated theologies are going to come crumbling down in the days ahead because the Laodicean facade has got to crumble before God's people begin to hold on to truth. Mm. Guys, when living by God's commandment is an outward manifestation of an inward reality, you move in power. Does that make sense? When I know in my heart who Jesus is, his name holds weight from my heart. 
when God's word holds weight with my heart, I can enforce his word. I can, I can enforce against demonic cords the word of God when I have already brought my own flesh into subjection to it. They are easy to bring into subjection to it. But when my flesh is constantly entertained by their things, I can't, if I can't even corral my flesh, how am I going to corral them? We need to understand why Jesus was so easy. Now, now yes, he, he, I mean, he's the son of God. He is Messiah. But, you know, why he was able to command even the environments around him to obey the kingdom? Because everything in him, spirit, soul, and body, was submitted to the kingdom. He did it as our example. He never did it to prove that he was God. He did it for our example. He wouldn't even do a miracle to prove his messiahship. He always did a miracle to help somebody in need. But when the Pharisees said, show us a sign, it's like, are you stuck on stupid? Have you not been seeing me reach out and love to all these people around me? And after you see me with the, you know, the, with the man with the withered hand and I tell him to stretch it out, now I know it really, it really bent your theology that I did it on the Sabbath, but you forgot this is my day. And then they still turn and say, give me a sign. No, I'm not, God never gives you a sign based upon your stipulation. He always proves his word with signs and wonders, not your questions of that word. But the guy who stands on the word will get the sign and the wonder. So we've dealt with gold, we've dealt with Raiment, let's deal with the eye salve. You guys ready to do that? Let's go to Revelation chapter 1. Part of the problem when you don't preach the gospel of the kingdom, when you preach the gospel of repentance, we get locked into seeing Jesus simply the first time he came. See, see, Jesus, the first time he came, said, I have not come to condemn the world. But how many know that was the first trip? Have you read the book of Revelation? How many can feel the love in the book of Revelation? I can for me. And when we preach the gospel of salvation only and not the gospel of the kingdom, we forget he is the king. We forget that he is the creator of heaven and earth and all of creation is answerable to him by his standards, by his righteousness. And by the time we get to the Laodicean church, they have no fight. Not once did Jesus say, you stood up for something. He said, you rolled over and just played back to the world. There was no fight in them. There was no works in them. And he said, You're, you, don't, you need eyes, Sav, because you've lost sight of who I am. So we're going to find out here, because how many know that this, was, this is not a revelatory manifestation of who Jesus is going to be during the tribulation period? What we read in verse 10 through 18 is who Jesus was after the resurrection. The Jesus that saved you is this Jesus. He is King Jesus. And I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega, I am Olive Tav, the first and the last. What thou seest, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia and to Ephesus and to Smyrna and to Pegamus and to Thyatira and to Sardis and to, and to uh, the, uh, Philadelphia and unto Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and as I turned, I saw, I saw a seven golden candlesticks. And there's a lot of debate whether it was seven separate candlesticks, a menorah, or maybe even seven menorahs. But how many know, I, I think what he saw was this, to see Jesus in the feast, to see Jesus in, in the light of the Holy Spirit. But I want you to... To, to see what happens is I turned around to, 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 and I saw, and in the midst of the golden candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a raiment down to foot, gird about with paps of a golden girdle, pure gold was his wrap. 
and his head and his hair were white as wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were a flame of fire, and his feet were like fine brass as if they had been burned in a furnace, and his voice was the sound of many waters, and in his right hand was seven stars, and out of his mouth went a two-edged sword, and his countenance was shining like the sun in its strength. That is a picture of Jesus after the resurrection. That is the picture of Jesus. We need to see him on the cross to get saved, but the moment you get saved, that is your king. And this John who had walked with him three and a half years, this John who had leaned on his chest at, 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 during Passover, before the crucifixion, this John that Jesus so trusted, he said, John, I'm giving you to take care of my mama as the firstborn. It's amazing to me as he was dying to save the world, he didn't forget his mama. And John was the one that he trusted to do it. It's this John that said, and when I saw him, I fell dead at his feet. When I saw him as he really was. There's some stipulation. There's a book called Who Ate with Abraham? That he goes and he, he shows that all of the manifestations of God in the Old Testament, many of them we think it's just an angel where it says an angel of the Lord. That is not what it says in Hebrew. It's hyphenated. It is the man God. And in Hebrew, when you have a hyphenated word like that, it's always the second word that defines the first. It's like instead of saying baseball, in Hebrew it would be ball base. Or, you know, it, it, it's reversed because you, you need to understand what it is you're playing, or not ball game, but game ball that you're playing a game with a ball. And so when, the, when you have that and you have a messenger from God or the captain of the Lord of hosts, what, what it is, it's a manifestation of Jesus in the Old Testament. He's the one who, he appeared with a sword in his hand when he appeared to Joshua. And what's interesting in that when we always talk about when they entered into the promised land, the manna stopped. The manna actually stopped when Jesus showed up and appeared himself with a sword in his hand. And Joshua says, whose side are you on? He says, you better be asking whose side you're on. <laughs> Jesus is the one that killed 180,000 Assyrians in one night. That was Jesus. Your loving Wimpy little Jesus that says, everything's okay. He didn't say that with the Assyrians, did he? He's the one who brought Pharaoh to his knees. Just like in the book of Revelation, he's getting ready to bring the Pharaoh of this world to his knees. That's the Jesus, the moment you get saved, that is your God, that is your King, that is your Messiah. And the church has lost that. We have preached a wimpy Jesus that everything gets by with. But when you look at all the books I got back here in my library of saints before us, said we saw the real Jesus and we have dedicated our lives and given up everything for his cause so that we could be found worthy of him. And yet the Laodicean church says, you don't got to give up nothing. God going to give you more. More stuff to drown you in of this world. And don't be worried about what God thinks about you. Just, just be worried about what the world thinks of you. Oh, we've got to be respectable to the world. We've got to make sure that when they have us on the news that they, they say they're, they're, they, they like us and, and all this good stuff. They hated your master. John in 1 John says, if you're a friend to this world, you're an enemy to God. If you love the world, you're hating God. If you love God, you hate the world. Can't be both. Because we don't see who Jesus really is, number one, we are falling in love with another Jesus. A Jesus that everything is just okay. Now, how many know before you're saved... You're just doing what comes natural. You're a sinner, and you're dedicated to it. You're flowing with your nature. But the Word of God says that when you got saved, you were imparted a new nature, a new man, created in the image of Jesus. Then if I'm really serving that Jesus, 
I've got to be as dedicated to flowing to this new nature as I was flowing to the old. Because at least you were honest. And if you have really been born again, and you're trying to flow this other way, your spirit is constantly at odds with you. That's one of the things I, I admire about Mary, because when, when God delivered her and she actually began to hear from God, she began to challenge all the theologies that I have been taught that we have found later on, crumbs from Laodicea. She said, that just don't make sense. That don't agree with my spirit. Well, she didn't, have any, she didn't have the theological arguments in her head to argue with her spirit. Her spirit was saying, listen, this new nature that God has just freed in me is not lining up with what, you're, what, what everybody's talking about. And she would challenge me, and so I had to go back. And she goes, I don't know about this rapture thing. Prove it to me. And, and the little snippets that, I, that everybody gives, you know, she says, I don't see that. They go back and try to use Elijah to prove a rapture. Enoch to prove a rapture. If you read the book of Revelation, they were raptured out to come back during the tribulation period. <laughs> because they were so unique. God says, I got a task for you. We're going to put a pen in it and hold you about 4,000 know, 4, years because I got a job for you to do at the end of time. And so we're just going to bring you up here to bring you back down. And so if you want to use them, God can go ahead and rapture you now to bring you back during the tribulation period. Noah's Ark. How many know God did not put that ark on the moon while he flooded the earth? It was still in the earth. What Noah's Ark teaches us is that during the tribulation period, the same thing with when God began to pour the plagues on, on Egypt, if I'm walking with God and in covenant with him, I will always have a Goshen around me if I'm true to that covenant. And I have yielded to the Redeemer. Everything that they try to prove the rapture on, I, I, you, know, you can go back and just, and not even get deep theologically. You don't have to whip out the Greek and the Hebrew. You just use something called common sense. Doesn't add up. Well, Mike, what if you preach this and you're all wrong? Then I'm going to take a load of Marines with me when he comes. Because I believe that is the task of the kingdom. God is preparing us to be spiritual marines, and we're still out on the playground with the little sticks trying to play soldier, thinking we're never going to have to really ever face the enemy. We're never really going to have to go through anything. That is an American Western society belief system because you can go into foreign nations right now. None of them are buying this stuff because they have been tribulating for quite a while. How many have ever read the history when communism took over China? What's interesting is all the post-tribulationists survived the taking over of China. You know what they say to us? So Jesus said, when you see the evil come to flee the mountains, I know this, is, this isn't Jerusalem, and I know this isn't the Antichrist, but it sure sounds good to me, and they flee to the mountains. All the pre-tribulationist believers in China, when, when China fell to communism, they say, Jesus is going to get us out of here before it gets too bad. They all died for their faith, or maybe lack thereof. We need to understand. One of the things that, that the military drilled in me is you have peace through combat readiness. We want to have peace of the kingdom of God without being combat ready. That's just like of our police officers, and you have gangs taking over the streets in Springfield, and they leave all their weapons behind, and they begin to cart around flowers, giving flowers to gangsters. How many know that that will not maintain any peace anywhere? It is through being able to enforce the law and having the weapons of your warfare, which are not carnal, to take care of that, that maintains peace. If you're strong in God and in his commandments and who you are in Christ and you really have a true picture of Jesus and you start bringing yourself in line with him, you can start maintaining some peace in your homes and in the areas around you when you know whom you have believed and you start walking like a man or a woman of God who has got been given weapons by God to maintain the kingdom. And it, somehow or another, since the 60s, America has turned to flower child theology. Hippie theology. And now do they not only have flower children, but if you look at a lot of churches, they're into free love and everything else that went on with that. There's no preaching of righteousness. 
But the gospel of the kingdom, guys, first examines Jesus as Savior that leads men to salvation, but then must herald him as the all-powerful king that empowers the church and prepares the church and begins to tell the church, this is how you walk in my kingdom. And if you meditate on my commandments day and night, you're going to make your way prosperous. Why? Because you can enforce the kingdom. You can enforce it. You only really enforce what you're walking in. If you're walking in the ways of the earth, no matter how much you try to, to shake yourself like Samson did and try to stir up faith and try to... Have you ever seen how some believers, they get, they get into a pinch and they're trying to stir up faith? They think, I'm going to get loud! The devil doesn't care how, how loud you get. When I was in the military, we actually had some guys that were deltas. Deltas are kind of like Navy SEALs. It's like, although there have been many deltas have actually washed out of Navy SEAL training. They're the guys that are beyond special forces. Okay. So... We're in the bowling alley. Within, within our concern, there was a bowling alley, and that was the only place to go get snacks and everything else. And there were video games, and there was bowling, but there was also lots of beer. And a bunch of guys got rowdy, and they're yelling at each other. And there's a Delta sitting at the bar. Unless, you know, and with those guys, they don't wear a rank, so you can't tell that guy's a you know, command sergeant major or whatever. They don't wear a rank. Everybody knew who he was. And so there's yelling and fighting and throwing beer bottles. And a couple of us believers saying, we just come down here for a hot dog, you know. And the guy stood up, set down his beer and said, that'll be about enough at about that volume. Did you know that you could have heard a pin drop? Because they knew that when you have authority, you don't have to yell. When you're thinking, all I need is a paper clip to take out this whole room, there's an attitude that comes. At, you know, I've been in combat. I've taken down people with guns, people with a beer bottle. Don't, don't scare me. And I can clear this room in 30 seconds if I want to. And everybody around you can feel that. And so they're yelling and screaming. You say, you know what? That's about enough. <laughs> I remember... Phil and I were kind of standing there. It was one of those things you just kind of back up against one of the walls. It's like, I ain't going to throw a beer bottle. I don't want to be hit by a beer bottle. <laughs> you know? We, we come to eat hot dogs and play video games. And I just watched that. And Phil said, dude, that's kind of like what happens to the devil when Jesus shows up. That'll be enough. The devils don't yell at him. It's almost like parting of the Red Sea. Went, I went, okay. And they just began to orderly leave and to clean up their messes. He understood his authority. And he was confident in the weapons of his warfare. He knew what he had been doing because he had been tried in the heat of battle. You see, when you do that, then there's a spiritual attitude that you take about you. You're no longer playing with this world. You're at odds with this world, and the world knows it. There's a reason why when Jesus walked into the room, the devils cried out. It's like, holy moly, look who just walked in. <laughs> it's like, there, ain't, there ain't no place to hide. What am I going to do? Oh, I'm here. <laughs> you know, because they, they could see the kingdom flowing in Jesus. And yet we see with Peter that when he was walking, we want some manifestation of the supernatural power of God to come without a life that lines up with it. You know, I want to be able to walk like Peter, that people get close enough to my shadow, they get healed. That's because he had been walking with Jesus 24-7 for so long that there began to be manifested around him a sphere of authority and the kingdom that if he got close enough to his shadow, the sickness would have to leave. It wasn't because he got some whammy from God that morning, like charismatics teach, you know, just some special outpouring. It was his day in and day out walk that began to manifest that in his life because he walked with Jesus and he allowed the power of the Holy Spirit to finally get rid of his hoof and mouth disease and finally get to where he wasn't so rash. Because one of the things you, you find out by somebody that's a combat veteran is they don't react anything in rash. They're always calculating about six steps ahead of everything going on around them. 
a veteran that's been in combat can walk into a room and tell you who's there and what they have and who may be able to defend themselves and who can't. That's something they do. They always make sure there's nothing to their back where they can't see. Now, guys, that'll preach. What have you been hiding behind your back that's about to eat your lunch? You see, any time we try to hide things from God, instead of saying, this in my life is straight, this in my life is straight, I know the devil's trying to tempt me over here, but I'm already four steps ahead of him. I know where that leads. Therefore, I resist that temptation. I choose to do righteousness because I know where this leads. And I make sure there's nothing back behind here except the glory of God because I've been fasting and I've been doing the right thing and Almighty God becomes my rear guard. That is what the church learns during the book of Revelation. The purification, the clothing, and the eyes being opened of a church that has forgotten the very Savior they claim to serve. That's our warfare. Now, you have two choices, and we don't have a lot of time to do it. You can either learn who Jesus is now and learn to, to have, have gold the kingdom way and to have ISAV the kingdom way and have white raiment the easy way or the hard way. You're going to get dressed, and you're going to have to purchase gold from Jesus, and you're going to have to have the ISAV, and you're going to have to be zealous to repent. Either do it now the easy way or do it in the middle of the furnace. It's your choice. Because God says, I have plan A, the easier way. I have plan B, you're going to get to plan A, the hard way, if you follow me. Let's return back to the way of God. Let's turn back and say, this, it is time for us to open back up the word of God and discover who God is and discover who Jesus is, discover who Moses is, discover the commandments and the ways of God and to begin expecting the Holy Spirit to empower you to live them because you've been given grace. You've been given his power. That's the only way that spiritual warfare is going to work in the last days. The only way. I want to be ready. I want to be ready. Father, I just ask that you would loosen anointing on every one of us. Father, let us be zealous to repent. Father, I ask that you begin loosing a fresh anointing in our lives to show us any areas that do not line up to your word. Father, any areas where Laodicea has entered in, the, the east of the world has entered into us, Father, and has contaminated our faith. Father, let us be zealous to cleanse it by repentance and pleading the blood of Jesus over it and appropriating that which your kingdom has so wonderfully made available to us. Father, for Jesus to be considered holy in the earth, your people must once again become holy. Because we reflect him to those around us. Father, I believe in the days ahead we're going to see the greatest miracles. We're going to see healings. We're going to see salvations. But, Father, let this here in Marshfield and those that listen become communities that believers are brought in, that it strengthens them, it empowers them, and it doesn't water them down, that they don't begin learning things contrary to what you have written on their hearts. But, Father, they begin to learn to live in harmony to that which you have established in their spirits and that you have written on their hearts, we ask. In Jesus' name.